Coming up, we visit a museum telling the story of God's chosen people and see how the Old Testament is being translated into languages that have no access to the Bible. Welcome to 700 Club Canada. It's great to have you with us today. Let me ask you, Bill, what play, like how do you read your Bible outside of prep for sermons and all of that? Just good old Bible reading. Yeah, well, I mean, I love technology. Um, so there are a couple of great apps yeah. that you can use. version is great. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes I'll go through a devotional reading. Um, so it'll be 21 days and it just pops up automatically and I can do it with my men's group and we watch together and actually read together and oh, it can good. add comments. And then also on my calendar, yeah. I just have a scheduled daily reading and so it pops up what scripture I'm supposed to read. So yeah. yeah, technology has made it a lot easier. Yeah, you know what? I like the version app, but I just like opening my Bible. I love holding a book. So <laughs> whatever way, just get in the Word of God. That's it. Well, now a new museum attempts to tell the entire history of Jewish people. Watch this. Anu, it means us. That's the name of the new Museum of the Jewish People in Tel Aviv. Its goal? Tell the story of God's chosen people from Abraham until today. It's the biggest museum of its kind in the world. So whereas there are literally hundreds of Jewish museums all over the world, this is the only one that attempts to tell the whole story. The museum combines artifacts, stories, artwork, and innovative technologies to tell the good and sometimes difficult history of the Jewish people like never before. CEO Dan Tadmore believes this story is relevant to both Jews and non-Jews. We refer to Judeo-Christian values as the bedrock of Western society. They are Judeo-Christian values. It's the things that we share. It's the values of the Bible. The museum covers 72,000 square feet of exhibition space spread over three floors. One aspect features interactives. So does your name come from the Bible? So let's punch in, Jonathan. Here we go. And you will be happy to learn that Jonathan struck down the Philistine prefect in Geba, and the Philistines heard about it. Saul had the ram's horn sounded throughout the land. And this one shows how to make uh, ethnic Jewish foods from around the world. I think I'm going to go for the stuffed leaves. Okay, let's go. So you get your list of ingredients, wow. but now you actually need to work. Uh-oh, okay. You begin by, by putting the rice in the bowl. So drag the rice into the bowl. Oh, okay. Add the ground now, beef. Add the ground beef. Great. Now you're gonna have to grate the onion. So grate the onion, go back and forth on the grater. So this is fun, but it's also, you know, you come away with a recipe. More than 50 original films help tell the various parts of the story. We're now on the historical wing. And this wing is a chronological track that begins with Abraham and ends with the establishment of the state of Israel and beyond. It's a seven minute huge projection that tells the entire story of Jewish migrations through the ages. The path begins with the 6th century BC exile of the Jewish people to Babylon. Until then, all Jews resided in one place. So for 2,000 years and the present, Jews always live in diverse places and proceeds to include the first believers in Jesus. And of course, the first Christians considered themselves Jews because they were. And so this is that part of history. This diorama tells the story of the competition between this newly founded religion, the cross, in front of a synagogue. Visitors can learn about the Inquisition, how Jews in Spain were forced to convert to Christianity. Even though the dark chapters in Jewish history like the Holocaust are part of the story, Tadmore says the museum is about Jewish life. When we look at Jewish history and Jewish life, we refuse to do so solely from the position of the victim. Jews have not only been persecuted and survived. Along the way, we've thrived and flourished. The first Jews in North America established the first synagogue there in Newport, Rhode Island. This is a replica of a letter written by George Washington to the Jewish community of Newport, in which he basically says, the children of Abraham will always have a home in these United States. Wow. Tadmore's favorite item is here in what they call the Hallelujah Hall, dedicated to synagogues around the world throughout the ages. Most of the congregations represented are still in use. This was one of the biggest synagogues in Warsaw, Poland, 
Blown up by the Nazis, the leadership hid the holy items before the Nazis arrived and then secretly sold them to feed the Jews in the ghetto. So this is the actual object from a synagogue that was destroyed by the Nazis over 70 years ago. And it miraculously survived because a Swedish philanthropist acquired it. It somehow made its way to Stockholm, probably because you were able to dismantle it and send it, and it has survived. The synagogue didn't. The congregants of the synagogue didn't, but the menorah did. And so you asked me about my favorite object. Tadmore says the museum is so big you can't see it all in one day, but that only encourages people to return again and again to interact with the never-ending story of the Jewish people. Julie Stahl, CBN News, the Museum of the Jewish People, Tel Aviv. I actually really love museums because museums are buildings in which objects of historical significant artistic or cultural interest are stored and exhibited. And I had this thought for you and I today. What if we are God's museum? Uh, 1 Timothy 1.15 says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst, but for that very reason I was shown mercy so that in me the worst of sinners Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. A museum cur uh, curator arranges all the pieces on display actually to tell a story. And I got this idea, what if we were to allow God to curate our life? Would God arrange all the experiences, even the difficult and painful ones, in such a way as to tell a story of his redemptive work? And the reason maybe that he'd want to do that is so that those who saw us would be encouraged that what God had done for us, he could do for them as well. I got thinking maybe ultimately everything, every joy and victory, every shame and defeat, every common and normal part of your life, if arranged by God, tells an amazing story of his power and his love. So when people walk through the museum of your life, what do they see? What do they experience and walk away with? Maybe you need to reclaim your identity in Christ. We have this great resource simply entitled Your Identity in Christ. Why not call us today at 1-855-759-0700. We would love to pray with you today. Now after the break, what will it take to translate the Old Testament for the world to experience it today? We'll find out when we return. In whatever circumstance you face, God wants you to have victory. It's not too late. Believe that God wants to do a miracle in your life. And if you need to talk with someone who understands, all you have to do is call us at 1-855-759-0700. A prayer partner is waiting to listen and pray with you today. On Pentecost this year, these men and women gathered at the Garden Tomb to work on expanding the use of the Old or Original Testament worldwide. The original Testament gap refers to the fact that the Original Testament is under-translated, underused, and frequently misunderstood. We therefore commit to do all that we can to accelerate the translation of the Original Testaments into every living language in order to help fulfill the Great Commission. That resulted in signing the Jerusalem Declaration to eliminate the original Testament gap. Well, that's what this consultation is, is about. We have people from around the, the globe that have gathered here very prayerfully to seek the Lord, saying, Lord, we're now aware that there is this very significant gap. Would you show us what we're to do and how you would have see this eliminated, this gap eliminated. YWAM's David oh, Hamilton explains why they chose to use the term original testament. Because when something's old, you just want to toss it out and replace it with something else. Original speaks of a foundation that has legacy and value in a multi-generational way. The original testament was the Bible that Jesus and the apostles used. And we want everyone to have access to it. The New Testament is most comprehensible when it's really connected to the original testament. They point out that this is needed to fully understand the New Testament. The original testament is the foundation for us to understand the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus came preaching. Can you imagine reading the New Testament 
and you come across mention of David or Abraham or Moses or Rahab or Gideon or any of the other heroes of our faith or places like Bethel or Jericho or Jerusalem and events like crossing the Red Sea or manna in the desert and you have no idea in your language what those stories were about. What happened? Who were these people? To illustrate their point, they published the Gap Testament, a version of the New Testament without any references to the original Testament. So when there's a direct quotation, the, the text is whited out. When there's an intentional allusion, it's toned down to watermark level. And so this is what it looks like in Acts 7, when Stephen is talking and giving his sermon that gets him killed. And all but two verses are direct quotations out of the original Testament. And you can see as you go through the scriptures, different parts are just missing because when we read it, the New Testament, without an understanding of the original, we do not get the full picture of God's purposes. So we just want the fullness of God's good word to be available to all people. The goal is the whole word for the whole world. Now comes the strategy, tools and help they need to accomplish this huge goal. Oh, first we're going to ask the Lord that His Spirit will stir people in their hearts and that they will want to participate and understand how important it is to understand that the only scripture that Jesus' disciples and Paul had was the original testament. And they're asking for the body of Christ to join them. If you have this burden to eliminate that gap, we would invite you to start praying for it. Pray for all the languages in the world. 90% of the languages do not have the original testament. Start praying for those languages. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Wow, I'm always learning something. I mean, I had no idea that 90% of the world's languages did not have the Old Testament or what's referred to in this segment as the original Testament. And it is so true that without the original Testament, the Old Testament, you can't actually fully understand the New Testament. See, the New Testament is intimately connected to the Old Testament because it tells the full story of God and how Jesus is actually the fulfillment of everything that was predicted in the Old Testament. The Bible's not just a book of history but it is alive, it's transformative in our life when we receive it as God's word to us. Hebrews 4.12 is such a great reminder of this. It says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. We have a great resource for you. It's free. It's called 700 Clubs Scripture References. And it's a really simple resource that you can look up keywords and it will tell you in the Bible where to go look to learn more about that. So if you want this free resource, just call us 1-855-759-0700. And maybe there's some uh, interesting words and study that you've never considered before and you're going to find the answers in the Old Testament. Well, after the break, 2,000 year old waste material becomes a treasure for today's archaeologists. Someone should download the CBN Family app to get an easy view at all of CBN's media. Having access easily to that faith-based content is so invaluable. This is a great way I could take that with me on the go, you know? This app is really easy to use. My favorite feature is the fact that you can look at like the different like feeds, like the news, animations. This app has exactly what you're looking for as far as Christian values go. Building in Israel often turns up ancient surprises, like this 2,000-year-old workshop during the construction of a new sports center in the area of Biblical Cana in the Galilee. What we have here is a cave, an artificially hewn cave, um, which was hewn out by ancient quarriers 2,000 years ago. So this was both a quarry and a workshop uh, for the production of stone vessels. Ariel University archaeologist Dr. Yonatan Adler is heading the excavation. We have a huge amount of production waste, um, which includes both cores, uh, which were taken out from the inside of uh, mugs and bowls, which were produced here. It's vessels that, were, that had broken during the production process. 
Archaeologists uncovered literally thousands of these cores at the site, and what the craftsmen threw away as production waste 2,000 years ago has become a treasure today. This is an exciting find, and here for the first time we have uh, production sites in Galilee, uh, which, which we're able to excavate. Uh, and to learn more about uh, the observance of ritual purity um, 2,000 years ago. The New Testament specifically mentions stone vessels and purification laws when Jesus turns the water into wine at the wedding in Cana. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews. Stone is a material that doesn't become impure, as opposed to pottery vessels. If they came in contact with um, something impure or a corpse or something like that, then the pottery vessel would become impure and it would have to be broken, it couldn't be reused. Israel Antiquities Authority archaeologist Yardena Alexander said stone is considered pure all the time. If the population was concerned with keeping the purity laws, then they would make sure that they'd have some of these chalk vessels in the houses. Archaeologists haven't found any large stone vessels like the water jugs at Cana at the site yet, but they hope to be allowed to continue to excavate for more ancient treasures despite the building of the new sports center. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Reina, Israel. I don't know about you, but that was really fascinating because I, I love when you read a passage and you see something you never saw before. I never saw that the pots that Jesus turned the water into wine were stone. And the significance of that was because they were pure. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Christ's purity, um, how he gave his life. In, in, and I just, I just never thought of that. I'd never put those together before. And what a powerful image. It is. And you know what's so powerful about scripture, as we know, there's so many images that we, we can miss, right? Yes. And as I was watching that, I'm thinking about this, you know, scripture talks about clay pots, mm. right? And really, we're for, we are in many ways like this clay pot before the transformation of Christ. Right. And we're impure. And we're needing to be cleansed. And we're needing to be made pure like the stone pot. And that's what Christ does for us. Actually, his blood does that. Mm -hmm. And the, all the images, the connections of wine as we take it communion, representing the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ is better than any wine. It's better than, you know, any water. It's better than anything. Well, and it's perfect because here's the application. Maybe like me, you feel sometimes like you're broken, unclean, unusable. That clay pot. <laughs> that clay pot. But what God wants to do is take his perfect life and yeah. give it to you so you can be a part of what he wants to do, his purity, his life, his power, his his victory, that is so amazing. Yeah. And all through the blood of Christ, hmm. his pure wine that he pours really into your life and cleanses you. I mean, isn't that, <laughs> this is why scripture is so rich because it just enlivens the truth of who God is and what he does in our life. Well, after the break, scripture reminds us just how much God loves us and is willing to sacrifice for us. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples, for great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. There's a great story or parable in John chapter 10, verses 11 through 16, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. And I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. 
There are basically two scenarios here in this chapter that Jesus introduces. The imagery that he introduces in the first scenario, which is earlier in the chapter, and we didn't, didn't take the time to read. This scenario was of the sheep and the sheep pen in the village, and that he, Jesus, is the gate for the sheep. We find that in verse 7. And that through him, the sheep go in and out and find pasture. This gives a sense of safety and security. Thieves and robbers only come to steal, kill, and destroy. And here we have a picture of death, but through Jesus, we have life and we have it to the full, or we have it more abundantly. That might seem a little confusing to us at first to think about this, that, that Jesus is both the shepherd and the gate. But when we look at the next scene that Jesus paints for us, maybe we will understand just a little better. You see, in this second scenario, Jesus speaks of the threat of wolves who come to attack the sheep. This introduces a different picture than that of the sheep in the village, because wild animals would rarely come into the villages, even at night. And so we understand from Jewish context and, and history, this scene is that of the shepherd in the wilderness. Because often as the season moved on and the pastures near the village became dry and barren, the shepherd would have to lead the flock further and further away in order to find food for the sheep. And that required them to stay in the wilderness overnight with the sheep. Here, Jesus draws a sharp contrast between the shepherd of the sheep and a hired hand. The true shepherd or the good shepherd would stand and fight off the wolf and protect the sheep, but the hired hand would run away and abandon the flock because he doesn't actually care for the sheep. He's just there for a paycheck. The shepherd boy David comes to mind. Remember him telling Saul how he killed the lion and the bear who tried to carry sheep off from his flock? Now that's a good shepherd. And here's the statement from John chapter 10 and verse 11. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He goes on and look what he says in verse 15. He says, just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life. There it is again. I lay down my life for the sheep. So this is significant. Of course, we know it's significant because Jesus ultimately gave his life on the cross for us. But it's also significant in light of what Jesus said earlier in the chapter about being the gate. Because when he said, I'm the gate, well, this is what he meant. Here's the picture he was painting for them. And he's painting for us today as well. You see, when the shepherd was with the flock in the wilderness overnight, he didn't have a pen to put the sheep in. And so he had to make do. So the shepherd would build a makeshift sheep pen with brush and with stones that he was able to physically move. He would build it up as high as he could, but would leave an opening for the sheep to go in at night and to come out in the morning. Have you got the picture? Okay, so here's what he would do with the opening. He would build his fire out in front of the opening a ways to discourage other animals from coming. And then he himself would lay down to sleep across the opening to his makeshift sheep pen. The shepherd was also literally the gate. Uh, I love that picture. I, I think it's amazing. Jesus cares for you and I like that. He is our protection. He is our gate and he's our shepherd. He sacrifices for the sheep. He lays down his life. In Isaiah 53, we have this picture of the suffering servant and it prophesies there that the Messiah will lay down his life, that he will take on himself our pain and bear our suffering and that he will die, that he will be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities and then eventually end up in a grave. And all of this will happen because of our wandering ways. Look what it says in verse six. It says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is such a powerful picture. There really is no greater love. John says it in chapter 15 and verse 13, than for someone to lay down their life for a friend. And my friend, Jesus has done exactly that for you. 
Well, that is a great truth. And it's just, just the reminder of scripture being so rich and scripture being proven through archaeology. And that is why this series, Written in Stone, is so fascinating because it proves that everything in the Bible is true. Archaeology and history is proving it to be true. And today only, for a one-time donation, you can receive Written in Stone. All you have to do is give us a call, 1-855-759-0700, and we will be pleased to send this to you today. So give us a call. It will enrich your life, and by your gift to us, it will help others. Names from the Old Testament are being unearthed all over the city of Jerusalem. This was amazing. Come as close as you can get to personalities that are known from the Bible. Astonishing discoveries made today. A jaw-dropping moment of Bible archaeology. This is much more than a thrill. This is actual history that took place here on the site where we sit right now. Confirm the kings and prophets of the Bible left real evidence of their lives. Right time, the right place, with the right people. And one of the most significant finds in recent history. Exactly as the Bible tells us happened in the days of King Hezekiah. Written in stone, kings and prophets. We have the Bible and we have archaeologists. Telling our story, it's matching. The Old Testament is a reliable history book. Written in stone, kings and prophets. I feel like I've learned so much today, you know? And I love your uh, segment where you were talking about loving museums and that they really are a story and how we, God really wants us to be in a sense, a museum and he writes a story of our life. Yeah, well, fascinating thought. I'm such a visual person. Okay, I love words, but I love words because they create pictures. And what I love about what we learned today was all the amazing pictures that the Bible uses yeah. to communicate this amazing story. And you're a part of that. And so I think you're right. If we could see all the parts of our life yeah. as these images, as pieces, sometimes broken, yeah. sometimes beautiful, but all arranged to tell a story and not our story. Yeah. God's story. That's, That's why it's it. called it's called his, his story. story. No, that's so true. And thank you for your comments. They're mm. so encouraging. Jenny, you said, we thank you all at the 700 Club Canada for standing with my family and I in prayer. Your support is much appreciated. Well, thank you for telling us that. And as we said, keep up the good work. May God continue to bless the entire staff. Thank you for your kind words. It really does mean a lot. As a matter of fact, words do have a lot of power. And so we appreciate that. And you keep using those words to empower other people around you. That's right. Zephaniah 317, love this verse. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves, he will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. <laughs> I love that. Just like a, a parent sings over their child, God sings over you today. Thank you so much for watching. To contact us, visit 700club.ca.